Right. Wonderful. So, um, yeah, so I've introduced myself. I think it's only prudent that we introduce our co-hosts for this evening. So we have Oriana Franceschi and Kate Wood from uh, Sheffield Creative Guild. And um, I'll pass the baton, so to speak. Thank you. Oriana, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Oriana. I'm Programme and Engagement Manager at Sheffield Creative Guild. So basically I handle our events program and all our the kind of membership side of the organization. Um, and I also uh, am in a band, Shelley Byron and the Poison Sleep, and I write the music and, and sing and play synth for them. That's me. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Kate. I'm the communications officer at um, Sheffield Creative Guild. Um, and that kind of does what it says on the tin. That's the marketing and the um, kind of all the communication that we do externally. Um, so if you don't know Sheffield Creative Guild, it's an organizational, um, it's a membership organization that was created just over five years ago by our colleague Jane, who is the director. Um, I've been with the organization for uh, just under a year now, and Oriana has been there for two. So we run um, a series of events and um, offer a number of different ways to well, our, our mission is to connect, support and promote our members and creatives in Sheffield. So we do that through um, events and advocacy work. Um, yeah, am I missing anything, Ryan? Yes, advocacy work. We've got you know some new stuff kind of in the pipelines. We're really interested in kind of making the Guild as representative as it can be of Sheffield's creative scene. So we've got some new initiatives starting next month, including a free profile option. So we can hopefully turn our website into a really cohesive database of all the artists um, from like whatever kind of background um, or specialism working in and around Sheffield city region. We're going to be launching a new mentoring scheme this year to kind of help people um, who wouldn't normally have or haven't historically had access to the arts and provide a bit of a route, at least uh, in Sheffield, uh, for those people. Um, yeah, I think we've covered it all. We can crack on. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, and uh, the primary reason for inviting um, yourselves here is in the previous uh, workshop, we sort of identified that within the Bauhaus, there was definitely a structure that was very misogynistic with regards to um, the means of advancement within it. Um, and uh, one of the things that I wrote actually upon promotion of this um, particular workshop was that um, the only way in which we can the, uh, the only way in which we can sort of reimagine the Bauhaus for the 21st century is to um, uplift the women that the Bauhaus left behind um, and to sort of center women in any sort of reimagining that we may have. Uh, and yeah, I think that the Creative Guild as that and with yourselves being sort of front and center um, as sort of the people leading it um, sort of is a real testament to the ways in which one, the sort of arts institutions within Sheffield are doing a lot and have done a lot, but there's still a lot more to do. Um, and I just wondered what your thoughts were um, and what your personal journeys were with regards to sort of arts institutions that you've been in contact with and whether they've been uh, for the most part positive or whether there has been this sort of knockback for you with regards to um, approaching and working within arts institutions. Well, Kate and I were actually chatting about this yesterday because we both have a background in film and um, we've 
both experienced uh, film exhibition, like cinemas and film festivals as places where a lot of women work and you will get women in senior positions and that's great. But so often you find that those senior positions have to do with administration and with finance and with kind of greasing the wheels for the creative work to happen, but that actual creative work is allocate, allocated to men. Uh, so men are still programmers, men are making the kind of uh, gatekeeping creative decisions. Um, and that I think extends to film production as well. So, you know, women will be producers on films and that's a role that a lot of people now are playing with and making more creative, but typically it's something that's kind of about, uh, taking care of the practicalities that make making a film possible but men will still be writing the films and directing the films and and so so often it feels like there are more opportunities for women there's more visibility for women but it's a bit elusive because actually it men are still in control of of the creative work that's happening so often um and I think that is something I've come up against in my career. Um, certainly working in film is just a very sexist environment. Um, I did work at Tyneside Cinema. I don't know if you guys saw last year. Um, it was in the news a lot because uh, there were uh, allegations came out about like a very uh, sexist and like sexually predatory work environment um, and I had a pretty horrible experience working there not uh, not as extreme as those that were reported but I had like a really awful male boss that made my life misery in quite a gendered and shitty way um, so yeah I think it, it is something I've come up against and it is a real pleasure now at the Guild um, to work in a team of all women. I mean, I've I've worked with people who are not women and it's been great, obviously. Um, but I mean, we're pals. <laughs> 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 we have a fun time. And uh, there's just never, there's never that feeling of, I'm in a room full of men, I will always still speak up and, and say my piece, but I am less sure of being taken seriously or listened to in that space than I am when all of my colleagues or the majority of my colleagues are women. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I have experienced a lot of kind of, like even when I was working at DocFest, it's like, repeatedly I was working in the talks and sessions team and repeatedly people would men <laughs> would arrive uh to give talks um and I would have been emailing with them for months and they'd assume I was a volunteer and be very dismissive and rude to me which tells you everything you need to know about them um but yeah I've never had any experiences like that having having worked at the guild so, yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a ramble, but <laughs> that's my basic background and where I am now. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, sorry. I was, I was just saying, it's, it's certainly not a ramble, it's uh, sort of valid, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was actually talking to my girlfriend about this today, um, and because she has a uh, an arts admin background as well, so um, we have often worked in organizations that have worked together so we'll kind of know each other's workplaces and um and and she was like kind of saying but you know loads of loads of women work in the arts and I was like yeah but look at all of these organizations that I've worked with where there are it's predominantly women who work there but it will be a man who's the director of the organization so I think it's very difficult um and similarly to what Ariana has just said there'll be a lot of those organizational production roles making things happen but then that top job more than often in my experience has been a man um when I was fresh out of university though um I had a it was a I had a kind of placement um uh, it was like a six month work 
placement. Um, and it was a very small organization and it was headed up by a woman who was older, she was in her 60s and she'd set up the organization. And I actually had a really, really difficult time working with her. Um, and I think ultimately, I realized that the problem was, I think she was quite intimidated by anyone who worked underneath her, who, I mean, I was just out of university. I wasn't exactly kind of pushing her in any way, but I think there's a fear that once you get into that position, you you need to kind of put all defenses up to ensure that nothing's going to um, endanger that that position of power that you finally found yourself in. And that was actually one of the worst working experiences that I've had. Um, so working for the Guild, it's, it's this totally different um, environment. And I think Jane, who is the director and who set up the Guild, she works really hard to create this really um, supportive and caring environment. And it's unreal how much of an impact that has on your ability to work and your desire to work um, and to do a good job. Yeah. Um, and she works really, really hard at that. Like she is a very active manager, um, which is quite rare as well. Cause you often get people who, especially in the arts, people do things because they love it so much. I used to work for Brighton Fringe um, and it was awful because everyone was like fringe theater is the most important thing. And it's, you know, cut us open and we bleed fringe. And it's like, well, I don't, I'm <laughs> largely here because you pay me. Um, yeah and it creates these awful environments that people are working huge numbers of overtime without being paid and the expectation is that everyone will do that but Jane is really actively trying to make sure that we're comfortable we're happy and knowing that the result of that is that you work to the best of your ability um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the work that the guild does and the goal of the guild is to support and foster creative communities so that's followed through in the work that Jane does with the people that work for her so yeah I really like this idea of like the Bauhaus and the guild as like two different kind of sides of approaching a similar sort of idea but going about it in very very different ways yeah i think that that's the the sim the similarities are in the practice rather than the uh sort of leadership structure mm. i think that that's as that's as far as it goes um and yeah one of the, uh, the the other reason that i wanted to sort of invite you here is because of one particular sort of incredibly dynamic woman that I just wanted to celebrate, whose uh, name is either Renata Richter-Green, um, or as she was commonly known, uh, Ray Supo, uh, latterly in her life. And this is the point at which I sort of try and skillfully share my screen. Um, and lead you onto the key note. Right, can everybody see this is the first thing. Yes. Right, wonderful. Technology is working this time around. It didn't last month, but I think we're getting somewhere. So yeah, here we go. So, so yeah, Ray Supo, um, as I'm sure that everybody can see, an incredibly glamorous woman um but yeah she was just a firehouse of a person just a wonderful wonderful uh, i think earlier on i confessed to oriana and kate that i have a crush on her <laughs> she's just I mean, just as a yeah we all agree so. <laughs> it's our new shared a, crush very yeah. legitimate crush yeah yeah and if you, if um, Connor and Ben, you, by the end of this, you have a crush on her, I would perfectly understand because she's just as a 
figure. She's incredible. Uh, writer, um, experimental filmmaker, um, journalist, um, cloth maker, businesswoman, lover, potentially a spy. Just <laughs> the list goes on. She's just incredible. <laughs> but yeah, um, so a little bit more about Rhys and Pearl. Um, she joined the Bauhaus in 1921 um, after submitting a portfolio of her works. Um, uh, yeah, original, uh, but yeah. Uh, she was fascinated by the uh, Johannes Itten's uh, colour theory. She really sort of bought into um, his ideas of Maz Dasnan, which um, in an earlier sort of uh, Zvishin workshop, I spoke about Johanna Zittin's uh, colour theory and how it, and Maz Dasnan being a sort of white supremacist uh, sort of ideal. And that's, that's one of the things that didn't really sit well for me. Uh, now, contra contrary to the sort of ideas of Maz Dasnan, she actually went away and came up with her own sort of personal motto um, by going away um, and learning Sanskrit uh, privately um, at a um, school in Jena, which was 20 miles away um, from where she was studying at the Bauhaus in Weimar. She used to cycle um, every day. Um, she used to do uh, six hours um, study in um, at the Bauhaus in Weimar, uh, where she um, stayed. And then she did four hours study of Sanskrit um, after, a 20, after a 20 mile bike ride. <laughs> so she did evening classes uh, that went on until like 10 in the evening. And then just went out, par went out partying in the evening in Weimar, uh, drinking cocktails. She was just, honestly, She's the cut. She, I would want to go for drinks with this woman. She's just <laughs> phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and yeah, she took the preliminary course twice as well because she just wanted to make sure that she knew every single little thing about it. She wasn't content that she'd taken in all of the information the first time round. So she re enrolled. <laughs> She's the only person that I can see in all of my research that ever did the preliminary course twice. Oh, hang on. No, wrong way. Apologies. There we go. So yeah, um, if anybody understands Sanskrit or can read it, then fine. But this is as close as a um, translation as I could get um, for um, that. I'm not even going to attempt to read that because I'll mistranslate, mispronounce it. But roughly translated, it's greed is the root of all evil. Uh, which became her personal motto. Um, and again, she um, created a uh, carpet weaving of this, which she made in, apparently, um, again, unfortunately, the original was destroyed um, as a piece of degenerate art by the Nazis in 1941. Um, but um, the original was apparently um, incredibly complex abstract forms and colours and she was very interested in creating a universal language of colour and she felt that through her understanding of Sanskrit um, that there was a universal universality between colour and shape that was common to all peoples and that was what she was trying to get to with her understanding of um, paint um, back then um, and of um, weaving and of the different uh, structures and the different mediums that she was studying within the Bauhaus. It wasn't until sort of 1923, 1924 that she actually moved on to experiment in film and photography. And it was as a result of a romance with the uh, experimental filmmaker Viking Egerling um, that um, she actually 
um, entered into experimental filmmaking. Um, she became um, his uh, assistant um, in his workshop in 1924. And it was at that point that she helped him uh, on the production of Sinfonie Diagonal, which um, I have posted the um, full uh, short on my uh, Instagram. Uh, it's on uh, the IGTV. So if you haven't um, as yet had an opportunity to look at that, I just think it's wonderful. Um, again, sort of a really um, sort of blissfully simplistic uh, display of sort of abstract forms and the music of the time. It really sort of says the jazz era, um, sort of that that film. It's I really really think that as a piece of experimental cinema, it stands the test of time. And then again. Um, so after the, her sort of brief tryst with Viking Egling, um, she decided that uh, when the Bauhaus moved to Dessau in 1925, um, she remained uh, first in Weimar and then in, uh, sort of stayed in Berlin. Um, there was a much more dynamic sort of uh, avant-garde um, scene that was uh, sort of erupted in Berlin. Um, and that is at the point where she met Hans Richter and helped him with, uh, again, another piece of uh, experimental um, cinema, a uh, film study in 1926. And that, at that point, um, they were married. Um, and it was, um, it was then that um, she became interested in illustration, uh, writing and journalism and started writing for Sporting Build, which is a sort of sports um, fashion magazine in Germany. Um, in, and in 1929, they, um, both her and um, Hans Richter, moved to uh, Paris and sort of develop the already, um, develop the connections that they already have with the avant-garde uh, filmmaker and photography scene that they'd established in Berlin uh, and sort of connected with other um, sort of avant-garde filmmakers like Man Ray um, and uh, others that had set up shop in Paris. Um, but yeah. Oh, again. <laughs> I keep going backwards as well as instead of forwards. But again. Oh, there we are. But yes, this was, uh, these are, uh, again, I, I did actually study German, so I will actually have a good stab at this. Uh, Transformationkleid, which um, roughly translated, again, is the uh, transitional dress. So uh, these were made uh, uh, by Resupo for her, um, she set up a new company in 1930 uh, called Ray Sport um, in order to, she recognized a need of women to actually wear something or to have something that was good for, good to work in but also could easily transform into sort of evening wear. The idea that you'd sort of go out to work and then spend ages getting ready in order to go out for a night on the town wasn't her style. And she recognized that it wasn't the style of the um, women that she was uh, sort of living alongside or working alongside. She was an artist, she was a journalist, she was sort of a working woman in the 1920s. And um, she came up with this design for um, culottes that basically had a pocket in the interior um, that had, so that you could fold up a larger area of uh, fabric inside 
um, that would then, um, as the evening goes on, you could remove the pocket and out of the pocket here, further fabric would drape out in order to make a floor length dress. It's so, you know, that when you're describing the, the thought that's gone into this, it really makes me think that it's, it's, obviously it was mad anyway, but it's mad that women were so restricted in what they could do in the Bauhaus because the very fact of them being women meant that they were forced to exist in a way where like, like the, re the whole reason that she was innovative in this way was that she was responding to the restrictions that were placed on her as a woman. Like the very condition of being a woman at that time meant that you, you know, like the, the kind of like function and form idea of the Bauhaus where something has to be beautiful, but also incredibly practical mm -hmm. is something that they have to work, like they have to think about all the time. And what was it, uh, Seidhoff Boucher? Boucher? I don't know how to say her name. Oh, who, I'm, I'm, I'm a side of Boucher, yes, that's right. Who, um, I was reading that she uh, created the, the toys for children that were like, made of multiple parts, but then they could all store away into these like tiny, very practical objects. Mm -hmm. Like, she knows as a woman that if you're making toys, you want to make toys that aren't going to take up a whole lot of space, that aren't mm. going to cause more work for you at the end of the day. And yeah, it's just such an oversight yeah. to kind of sweep all of that potential inventiveness aside. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, I've, I've spoken about Anne Saito Boucher. Her, um, her, her toys, her, her little ship um, building game, uh, was so sort of ahead of its time in its sort of apparent simplicity, but the complexity of the idea and the form of knowing full well that it had to sort of collapse down into something that was easily sort of transportable. Mm -hmm. um, and also her, um, she created the, um, a number of pieces of children's furniture for um, the, um, Bauhaus exhibition in 1922 that again was sadly destroyed but um, for the children's room all of the furniture uh, was sort of set out as if it was um, sort of a perfect replica of the furniture that was in the um, other rooms of the house but it was collapsible it had sort of it had uh, hinges that you could sort of collapse it all down and it was bright, it was sort of brightly coloured, sort of in red, blue and yellow, white and black. So it was, the idea was that it was sort of bright, it was colourful, but it was easily, you could collapse it down and stack it at the sort of edge of the room. So it was right, right. light years ahead of its time. Yeah, and because, you know, women are around children, or especially at that time, women would have been the ones around the children mm -hmm. and they knew the, how stuff in a children's room would function best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right. Now, are we going to go forward this time? Yes, here we are. Um, I wanted to draw attention to these, um, well, firstly, this one, just because the androgyny of this I just sort of couldn't ignore it. Uh, Resu Po with Philippe in, uh, at their home in Paris in 1936. Just astonishingly beautiful, the pair of them. And yeah, just sort of a scene of complete love and adoration. And somewhat in somewhat not in keeping with other images that you've seen of her, in that there is a sort of vulnerability and frailty. Yeah, it's I, one of those images, it's one of those photos that you see from a long time ago and it reminds you that you didn't invent being in love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very different to the self-portraits. Mm, yeah. Where she 
because as much as she looks androgynous here, you feel like in those she's trying to strike like a masculine mm. kind of pose or, or create mm. that kind of um, Yeah, she's like really exuding as much power as she can. Yeah. It feels like in those in those self portrait images, mm -hmm. and here it, there's like a a sense of play as well that you that yeah. you don't get from those other images. Mm. I think I think that is it, there is a sort of sharing nature mm. to it. But I mean, yeah, I just I think of of all of the photos that I've found, I think this is my favourite, mm. just because mm. of the the difference in it. But yeah, anyway, before I get too lost, um, <laughs> this is where I mentioned the possibility of Ray being a spy comes in. Now, um, Philippe Soupeau, um worked for the French, uh, well, he worked for a paper um, that was commissioned, and he was commissioned by the um, French government under Charles de Gaulle in order to visit um, and go as a political envoy to the regions of France. Um, he went to Algeria um, in 1937, and he he and his um, wife, when they uh, as they were as of 1933, uh, traveled to Tunisia um, in 1939. Um, now, the idea was to um, sort of um, appease the leaders of Tunisia at the time and to assure them that the um, that Charles de Gaulle and the French would uh, support Tunisia during the oncoming difficulties with regards to the rise of Hitler. Um, what what actually transpired, we're not entirely sure. Um, the only things that we do have are um, sort of a number of photos, of which um, Ray Supo um, took photographs of women who were in, I just need the light, um, who were in the reserved quarter of Tunisia. Now, the reserved quarter um, was so called because um, Romani and um, traveller communities within Tunisia were separated from the um, rest of the community. Um, women and men were also within the reserved quarter in large part separated from each other. So um, Ray Supo, um took it upon herself to go and find these women in the reserved quarter, um, apparently without the authorization of the lead, the leadership in Tunisia, in order to document the lives of the women that were living there and to shed a light on the atrocities, the lack of humanity that the one the people of Tunisia were well sorry the leaders of Tunisia were um, allowing to happen to their people and two that um, the French um, authorities were permitting or were liable in a, in sort of or culpable in allowing so again, we have we have here sort of um, a woman preparing herself, um, applying makeup. Um, this has been uh, sort of attested um, as an image of a prostitute. Again, um, that is sort of. Uh, under, consider under consideration and but again 
it's it's something that we can never be, we can never be too sure of. It is a it is an image of a woman in that situation. Um, all I would all I uh, sort of see from that is a person using their beauty as I think uh, we discussed earlier, sort of their beauty as armor and as the sort of the sort of last vestiges or the last sort of cash that they have, the only currency that perhaps this person has is that of their beauty and their femininity when everything else has been taken. Um, yeah, I think that for me, there is a sort of underlying sadness to it. What, uh, Connor, Ben, what I'd be interested to see what your thoughts are as well as other people's. I think, yeah, I do sort of sense the sadness in the photos, but also I do feel that they feel like quite powerful women. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's just in the way that they hold themselves and maybe the sadness sort of comes from because you can sort of understand the circumstance and that they were in. But yeah, I sort of see them as quite headstrong somewhat. I hadn't noticed sadness until you suggested it. I mean, maybe. I think the fact that it's in black and white is always going to make it look more like that. When I mm -hmm. first saw this, I just thought she's getting on with things. She's got somewhere to go. She's being very practical. She's getting ready on the go. It feels, it's an interestingly, it feels like a candid shot as she walks past. Mm. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, the, the bottom one is a very, it's a very defiant look, breaking the fourth wall. Um, so I can definitely, I agree, Karma, that there, you get a sense that there are, there's reserves of kind of energy and um, re, there's, there is, there's something there still. It isn't a kind of defeat. It's not a moment of defeat, it feels like. But. Mm -hmm. She must have been a very, um, she must have been a very special kind of a person. The, the, the woman in the lower shot, like she does, there is a look of defiance, um, but not, she doesn't look kind of guarded, like she's sitting mm -hmm. with her foot up and there's something quite um, kind of searching in her face. And I think to have gone into an environment like that and to have, you know, managed to get this kind of intimate, a picture of someone, that Ray must have been, yeah, quite a, a kind of, obviously a curious and brave and inquisitive person, but also someone who felt kind of kind and understanding. Yeah, I think that it's it it shows her skill that she was able to engage with the subjects on a purely human level mm -hmm. i think that there's def there's definitely a it feels like there's an understanding mm -hmm. and i'm not into, i'm not sure whether that's sort of born out of I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm not entirely sure where that's born from. Just a sort of shared, a shared view on the nat on the sort of nature of femininity, or whether it's something deeper. Interesting. Mm. But yeah. There we go. And yeah, just this last one here. Um, sort of, I put these two next to each other just to sort of, I love the sort of duality of the, the images. The fact that she can sort of exist in these two 
sort of states the fact that these were taken at pretty much exactly the same time well not exactly the same time but um at the, at the stage where at the stage at which she was taking an image of this woman clearly in an incredibly desperate state she was also looking immaculate like this <laughs> It's and sort so of free. sorry. Sorry, and does she look so free? Yeah, well, I, just, I don't know because I'm looking at this one and seeing a kind of mirroring between this and the the portrait on the previous slide of the woman putting the lipstick on as someone who is using all the tools in their toolkit to mm -hmm. um, disguise any kind of vulnerability. She's really presenting like it's a very um, artificial image in that it, it looks very she's curated this moment yeah. the way that she wants to be perceived in and she's wearing this you know trousers and there, there's quite a masculine look to this and the pose and the smoking and this you know it's it's not a traditionally feminine image and I think it's interesting seeing these two images of women kind of using their image as a shield to kind of deflect. That's true. but then she does to have been less. I think that's true, and I, but I also think that she does seem to have been quite genuinely wary of the trappings of a traditional mm. female role in life. Like I, I read that she and Philippe separated. They went and did their own thing, and then when they were older, they lived together in the same house but in separate flats. Mm -hmm. Like. You know, and I think, you know, I think it's still true to an extent now. And I think it was certainly true then that she, in, as well as presenting this kind of like, you know, she played with femininity. She could look very feminine sometimes, as we saw in the first image. But I think as well as presenting this kind of like, quote unquote, masculine persona, like that's an attitude that she adopted to life, like to to my mind, to move through life that way where you avoid the trappings that would prevent you from creating your art and traveling and having adventures. There's something, and again, doing air quotes, masculine about that mm. to me. Mm. She also just looks so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think that Is there a sort of shame in the fact that she's had to adopt this, do you think? Or is she sort of reveling in it? The fact that she's had to adopt these sort of trappings of masculinity in order to advance herself. I mean, maybe I'm I'm maybe I'm reading it in one way, but the other way is a real kind of like fuck you moment. Mm-hmm because it's definitely there's a confidence to it and there's a knowingness about it not being the image of femininity that was traditional at that time mm -hmm. you know I mean she can obviously we don't know but mm. she, she can feel shame and still challenge us um like because there is something about her gaze that Luke it's not a face full of glee. <laughs> mm. um, so yeah, it does look, it does look like it's potentially a fuck you. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to say because you can see traces of what might be a kind of melancholy there. Yeah. She I mean, like, look, sorry, you go I was going to say, she looks like she's only interested in the smoke. <laughs> not looking at the camera. She's not just yeah. looking into the distance. She's just... Just really enjoying that cigarette, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Kana, did you have a, uh, anything to add? I think um, going back to what you were saying about the sort of the like subvertive nature of her presenting is quite like these masculine traits, and I think maybe potentially she was using that to her advantage in the sense that she was a woman in the bar house at the time. 
and she sort of potentially will have known that she wasn't able to advance in the same way as her male peers that were around. And I, I don't know, I sort of think maybe she created this, whether it was a facade or not, she created this persona of power to show them, you know, mm -hmm. I am just as powerful as you potentially. Um, and, and, you know, potentially it was genuine or, you know, maybe she's the only one that will know that, but, um, but yeah, I sort of see it as like keep playing, playing it to, as an advantage somewhat, if mm -hmm. that makes sense at all. Yeah. Perhaps she's, perhaps she's playing a game with everyone and she's yeah, the like, only one that knows, she's, and she's, she's the only one that knows yeah. it's a game. Yeah. And I suppose, I suppose at the time it's still, you know, your options are very binary. There's like women look and behave in this way. Men look and behave in this way. Men have more power than women. Um, you know, so if you want to kind of move into those like male dominated spaces, it, you know, this is an option for trying to appear on their, on their level and be able to navigate those spaces in the same or try and navigate those spaces in the same way that men do mm -hmm. it's the same thing that would happen that you know after second wave feminism as women start to enter the workforce then we move into the 80s and women are wearing shoulder pads and power suits mm -hmm. it's exactly the same thing mm -hmm. like i think we are moving past it now but this kind of trying to appear male mm. in order to make yourself more palatable um, in a mostly male workforce. And I think that extends to the culture of workplaces as well. Mm. Um, that you, I'll just, I think, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Do, do you feel that you've ever, you've ever experienced an uh, instance yourselves, uh, Kate and Ariana, where your dress has sort of impacted upon levels of your advancement or you felt that there's been a sort of level of friction with regards to your own your own roles I mean talking about sort of Ray here sort of in what people would consider masculine tropes and using that as a means of her own personal advancement do you think that that it still exists and if it does why and how does that how do we sort of unseat that how do we sort of get rid of that sort of misogynistic notion that you have to dress a certain way or you shouldn't have to dress a certain way at all yeah I think it definitely does still exist I think you it, it varies from industry to industry mm. what's expected of women but there's always yeah. an expectation there's no way of dress men can dress in a way that is not coded that is just plain normal man clothes <laughs> and women don't have that option whatever women yeah. wear it's interpreted as yeah. we something about them and i think that varies a lot from you know if you work in the service industry and you're interacting with the public, you're expected to dress a certain way. If you're at a very senior level in an organization, you're expected to dress a certain way. Um, I think I, I haven't felt it impact me. And I mean, I've just kind of worked um, by the kind of office roles where I, it was quite easy to understand what it was expected of I, me. I do think if you work in the kind of in the kind of roles that we've had in kind of small scale arts organizations, you know, there's much less pressure to kind of dress up for work in that way. But I do think it's interesting you say across different industries, because I think if we were working in different industries that we wouldn't have felt that way. You know, I always, whenever I'm talking to an estate agent, I feel really stressed out for them because <laughs> the women are always in, really tight pencil skirts and yeah. really high heels and blown out hair and I just think wearing heels all day every day heels all day and I just think that just does not look comfortable and it's hard <laughs> enough to be in an office chair for eight hours a day let alone with stilettos on top of that so yeah I think I think we've had a 
we have... well, I'm just speaking for you at this point, Oriana, but <laughs> I've had a fairly easy ride of it because yeah. of working in the arts, I think is more forgiving. We have, although it's interesting because when we're talking about um, representing as male in order to kind of, I guess, maybe feel more confident moving in a, in a potentially quite intimidating world. Like I do quite often if I'm like doing a performance of some kind, like whether that's something I've written or it's with the band or whatever, I'll quite often wear a suit or like a shirt and a man's tie. Mm. And I think it's because those things I feel kind of not masculine in them but kind of sexless like I feel like I can't be seen in an objectifying way and that makes me feel more comfortable when I'm trying to do something that I want people to take seriously I guess you mean you feel more like neutral yeah I think so like I feel I don't think that it makes me look masculine but I feel like it kind of all, like balances out the feminine parts of my mm. so that I just exist in kind of a neutral <laughs> mm. neutral <laughs> zone yeah well, it reminds me a bit of um um slightly different but Maria Bolshaw the um director of Tate mm-hmm. and so she is you know one of very few women in power in the arts world and you do often see not not saying that she she feels pressure to wear a suit or whatnot but there's always a conversation about what she's wearing and I think I remember seeing something about the shoes that she wears and um because she wears quite quirky shoes but you you sort of don't see that for the the men in the in the arts world mm-hmm. and I sort of I wonder sometimes does she feel a pressure to not wear a suit but does she feel a pressure to dress a certain way and I suppose it goes back to what um, I can't remember somebody was saying earlier about um, oh I think it was I think it was UK talking about the woman who you worked for mm. in the, in the yeah. basement um, and is that pressure yeah you perform in a certain way but then that also extends to what you're wearing do you feel if I wear this how is it going to be perceived and then is it that extra additional pressure in terms of the fashion and the, the outfits that you do wear yeah Honestly, it's, it's so exhausting being a woman sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it is exhausting. Um, but I feel like in such a high profile role. Oh, yeah. It would be very, especially when it's like, you know, people are going to, how she dresses, like I say, there's no kind of neutral way for her to dress. Whatever she wears, it's going to make people think like, oh, this is what her taste is like. And mm-hmm. if they don't like that taste, they'll be like, so why is she so high up at the tape? Mm-hmm. This is so bad. Yeah, because you're representing an entire institution. That must be That's high pressure. Yeah, it is high pressure. <laughs> yeah. I think <laughs> Lucky one of, some yeah. One one of the other things that is sort of related to but sort of like a adja- well adjacent, I would say, is lots of people have been praising uh Harry Styles for his sort of quote um, smashing of the gender norms with regards to his dress um, at the um, late at the sort of Grammy um, awards ceremony, and I'm just like he's wearing a feather boa <laughs> and, and not very interesting other clothes. He does it's wear like, it very well. He does. He does. <laughs> he's gorgeous. Yeah, he is. He's. I mean, no, he is. He's gorgeous. That's, that's an element of things. But I think I. I think on a on a friend's fashion um, uh, blog, I just replied to it. Um, feathers and pleathers and plaid. Oh my! And then uh, that sort of uh, rolling eyes emoji. Mm. He he's not. I wouldn't say that what he's wearing is earth shatteringly groundbreakingly have we not wonderful. Seen any of the like any of the things that have gone before it. There have been so many wearing a dress. Like there have been so many men yeah. before Harry Styles, but it's like all Harry Styles fans are like, oh, he invented he's a the, feather boa. Yeah. He's the, You've he's never the, seen a feather boa before the Grammys. Yeah. And he, yeah. Well, and he's he's like, uh, earlier this week and it was like 
it was like um, Harry Styles, people say Harry Styles destroyed toxic masculinity and it's the only that you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone had to do it, you know. Yeah. Thank God for Harry Styles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and we should, we should, we shouldn't moan. I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel, I feel like, a, I feel like it's sort of old, older than syndrome in my case. This sort of <laughs> no. But I think it is frustrating because Harry Styles, who is a cis straight, I'm not actually sure what his sexuality is. Um, I, don't, I, 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 I don't think that he's going to let anybody know anytime soon. Which no, is, it, which it, is his right. Yeah, uh, yeah, but. I mean, he he gets a lot of kudos for doing stuff that, like, queer and people of colour, like, queer people of colour might be, are often in a lot of danger for doing, are, like, are killed for doing, and historically yeah. have been killed for doing. And, you know, when Harry Styles does it, it's delightful and wonderful, and isn't he smashing toxic masculinity? But when other people do it, we don't like it it's dangerous mm. and they're in danger so it, it is you know i i i'm gonna say we do have something to moan about so yeah, if, yeah, yeah. sort of appro appropriating a culture that he only wants to dip his toe into yeah seems it, seems a little sort of sour so mm -hmm. sour in the mouth it looks like he he is influenced by people like Mick Jagger and David Bowie, they were certainly appropriating that culture at a time when it was even more dangerous mm -hmm. um, for, yeah, uh, for people who were, apart from anything else, not famous. Um, yeah. <laughs> that kind of prestige. Um, so I feel like, I don't think in his mind, he's trying to appropriate any like existing subcultures. I think that those are his influences. And it's just mm -hmm. that his fans are so young that they maybe haven't really put that together. And so they're all like, oh my God, he's hot, but he wears a dress. <laughs> it's never happened before. You know, that's, yeah. that's kind of what I see going yeah, on. Yeah, perhaps we're sort of realizing that his, his original fan base uh, was sort of like, one Direction Nears or whatever they call themselves. They perhaps don't have that like connect to other sort of branches of pop culture. Or they or they haven't thought to join the dots up. Yeah. You know what? If little girls aren't getting exposed to Mick Jagger, I'm fine with that. That's True enough. Let's leave under my thumb in the past. <laughs> yes. But okay, I will say Vogue magazine does know those reference points and putting Harry Styles on the cover in a dress and being like two two. Yeah. But that's all that's all I'm I mean, that's but I do think, yeah, most of his fans are yeah. they haven't got their design history, you know, pop culture history um straight. We should rectify that. <laughs> <laughs> just tell them <laughs> we'll take care yeah by definition culturally they are only looking in one direction so. <laughs> <laughs> bravo bravo that gets the that gets the, that gets the sort of wanky clap there i think that is this is yuck this is this is this is, this is the wankiest yeah. clap i can muster <laughs> oh, and i'm sorry i came <laughs> I think that rounded things off that little heated Harry Styles debate rounded it off nicely yes it indeed it that to Harry Styles yeah it's my cat <laughs> yes I think I that sorry <laughs> no I'm just I'm just wondering um, where to go where to go after that oh dear I think um barring any other burning questions that's the thing i haven't actually asked the questions from our guests are there any questions from our guests with regards to anything that we've had uh, and talked about on themes of this evening sort of expanding upon sort of uh ray Supo or women in art or 
sort of how to uplift the sort of experiences of women in art or thoughts, feelings, machi machinations, maturations. I don't have any questions, but I did think it's a good session. Um, and I didn't know who she was before this, so I've made a lot of notes. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah, that was actually... really good. Thank you. Yeah, I found it really interesting. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. That's great. Anyway, well, um, now that you're here, Connor, are we going to do the big reveal? <laughs> 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 right. do, it, do it do it do it, do it, do it. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> for, ne for next month's um vision um next month's vision 2.0 workshop three connor shields will be joining us for barda which will be an exploration of lgbt plus um influences in the Bauhaus and subversion and hiding in plain sight and influences sort of beyond the Bauhaus and how the Bauhaus has sought to influence the minds of subversive people. Connor, would you care to elaborate? Yeah. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit more specifically or are we keeping it? Well, you can be as ambiguous as you wish. I'll leave um, it up to you. We're going to sort of look at one, starting off with like a piece of architecture by um, an architect called Philip Johnson, um, called The Glass House, um, and sort of looking at the Bauhaus's influence on that. And then we're going to expand a little bit further um, in terms of like the ideas of living in plain sight. Um, yeah, I don't want to say too much more. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. What did you mean by Varda? My immediate thought is Agnes Varda. Um, Varda's Polari, um, for ah. looking. Oh, um, right, yes. So the ideas of, of living in plain sight, the, the glass house, meaning that it, it's, a, it's a space that you live in and exist in, but people can see in, you're sort of under a microscope. Um, and then also a Polari being an underground gay language, which is where people were able to communicate in public in a time when it was illegal to be gay. Um, so yeah, looking at maybe, there's not so much, well, I don't think there's a link between the two, but they both have the same idea of of, of living in, in plain sight. So yeah, bad looking. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. It sounds really good. I'm hoping to be there. Yeah, same. Yeah. Good. Well, um, for people who've been to one workshop, they will get a free ticket to the next one. So I'll send you the link. That is kind. Of, I'm happy to pay. Yeah, I, I would be happy to pay as well, of course. But thank oh, you. That's, that's, okay. no, that's fine. <laughs> Okie dokie. Well, thank you ever so much, uh, people, for coming. And uh, I hope to see you at the next one. I think it's going to be on the 14th of April but I'll send people uh, emails with regards to uh, the date and time. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah, so nice. See you soon. Enjoy the rest of your evening. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.